Hello students, this lecture is an introduction to the unit on truth. And um, recently, Time Magazine ran this cover, Is Truth Dead? Wondering that if in this day and age where we seem to be having so much fake news and so much uh, misinformation, disinformation, and outright deception, uh, that maybe the whole concept of truth is uh, done for. And so in this lecture, we're going to be... Uh, countering that and saying, no, truth really does matter and there is a way to find it. So in philosophy, this area of inquiry is called epistemology. It comes from a Latin word that means uh, to know or, to, or truth. Um, so the question is, what is the nature, origin, and what is human truth? Uh, what counts as knowledge? How do you get it? Um, how do you know when you possess it? And what are the limits? of what we call uh, truth or knowledge. So that's what the study of epistemology is, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Okay, so we're going to do a little thought experiment here. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to um, write down, uh, I'm going to ask you to pause the video in just a second. And I want you to write down um, two or three things that you know how to do and then I want you to write down two or three things that you know for certain as an idea or as a belief that you say, I just know this for absolute certain. A couple of things you can, you know how to do and a couple of things you, you mentally uh, know. So pause the video, write those down and then resume. Okay, so I assume that uh, since you've resumed the video, you have written down your list. So let's talk about the things in the categories of things you know how to do. That is called uh, performative knowledge. That is things that you know how to perform. And if I said, oh, I don't think you know how to play the tuba, then uh, you could say, oh, yeah, watch this. And then you could do it. Uh, if you say you know how to cook a souffle, then we say, okay, show it. And then you show it, and then we know. Uh, on the other hand, the other kind of ideas are propositional logic. That is things that you believe or you know to be true that are not related to things that you can actually demonstrate or do. And they're ideas, beliefs, knowledge that you have. So these propositional things that you know, where did they come from? So... Uh, philosophers divide this into two camps. There's the a priori and a posteriori. Uh, a posteriori is posterior. <laughs> it looks like it sounds like what it says. It, it's in things you know from experience. That is, they're in your rearview mirror, right? You've done them before. Uh, you've learned them in the past, and so you know it based on collected information. Okay, again, not performative knowledge, but things you have been experienced that you know uh, from the past. A priori knowledge are things that you have not experienced, but using the power of reason, you can arrive at a certain kind of knowledge, even though you've never experienced it. So let's take the example of that 23 is a prime number. Now, maybe you knew that off the top of your head. But if you do know what a prime number is, a number that can only be divided by one and itself, then I could give you any number you've never thought of before, and you could think about it using your previous knowledge. You could come to a new knowledge that you didn't experience before. So three, 23 is a prime number. You know that because you know what a prime number is. You know the factors, what 23 is, and then you come to knowledge that you have. Now, on the other side, uh, a posteriori knowledge is knowledge that you never would have arrived on your own without somebody telling you or you having some previous experience with it. So the idea that we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes is something you had to learn somewhere. You read it in a textbook. You had a biology professor told you. Uh, you read it on the internet. Somewhere you got that information. You're not a biochemist. You haven't done all this study of molecular biology. Somewhere along the line, somebody told you this, and you have taken it to be knowledge. 
So uh, those are the two kind of camps of knowledge of where what kinds we have stuff we were just know by reason intuition uh, somehow it's just in us or things that we have to experience and come to know by learning okay and that brings us to this equation k equals jtb um, in philosophy and especially in logic we like our little um, symbols and equations because it makes life uh, simpler to write things this powerful, this may be the most powerful statement in the universe. Um, and it is knowledge equals justified true belief. Let me say it again. Knowledge equals justified true belief. How do you know something is knowledge? When you say, I know this is the case, what do you have to have for it to count as knowledge? And so, what we say, and there are, again, there are detractors, and you can do lots, you can do a whole graduate work on this. But for right now, it's enough for us to say that in order for you to say something is knowledge, first of all, you have to believe it, right? You can't, like, say, I know something, but I don't believe it. Um, we do say that kind of weird. Like, for example, my son is a, is a senior in high school at the time I'm recording this, so I could say, Wow, I can't believe my son is a senior in high school. Now, that's a colloquial phrase. I don't literally mean that I don't believe it. Um, I mean, I'm really, I'm really saying is, wow, time has really gone fast and he's grown up just so quickly. Uh, but that's how we say it. I just can't believe that he is a, a senior in high school. But I know he is. Um, so those are, that's a way. But when we really come down to it, if you want to say you know something, then you have to believe that it is the case. The next thing is you have to have some sort of justification for that belief. You just can't pull it out of thin air, out of nowhere, and say, well, I just, I just know it. Uh, so what justifies that? So you either uh, you have a body of evidence that you've gathered up uh, and you've, you've read it on the internet. You've looked at an encyclopedia. You have uh, talked to experts. Whatever, you have gathered uh, information that you believe supports that belief and moves it toward knowledge. And then the last piece is vital, is that it has to be true. So what you believe and what you believed you're justified in must also be true in order to be counted as knowledge. And sometimes we can re we want to replace knowledge with facts if you want to. So you can believe anything you want to. If you want to believe that the moon is made out of green cheese, you can. Go ahead. But if you want to say, I know that the moon is made out of green cheese, or it is a fact that the moon is made out of green cheese, you first of all, you say, well, I believe it. I'm justified in that belief because I have some sort of, it looks like green cheese. When I look at a telescope, I see it looks like moldy, bubbly Swiss cheese. But then you have to collect data and evidence that will support that to the point that we then declare that it is true. It corresponds to the fact of the matter. So we're going to talk about that. So the, it really hinges on this idea of being able to demonstrate that something is true in order for it to be counted as knowledge. And then we have to decide how can we satisfy the truth condition. Now, there may be things you believe that you can never prove are true. Um, I believe that my wife loves me, and I could gather data, perhaps. Um, but at some juncture, I have to say, you know what? I believe it, but I couldn't prove it in, in any way that would satisfy a truth condition. I can't, um, beyond a shadow of a doubt, gather evidence that would prove that it is true. But I still believe it, and I believe I'm justified in that knowledge, in that belief, but I can't count it as absolute knowledge. All right, how about the idea that the world is flat? 
Um, by the way, LEGO just released a fabulous world map that is a, a two-dimensional map made out of little tiny little LEGO studs, which looks awesome. But anyway, what about the idea that the world was flat? Okay, let's agree that the world never was flat. Okay, so despite crazy people that are flat earthers, and we could talk about them later if you want to, but uh, the world has always been round. Now, there was a time when people believed that the world was flat. But that didn't change the fact that the world was not flat. Now, this is the tricky part. If you were to read books written in, in uh, uh, medieval times, um, they would have said that they knew that the world was flat. Um, and it, what they would say it was knowledge. They would say it was a fact. But it was not. It was a belief. And people acted on the belief. So in many ways, it functioned as a fact. And that's a whole other thing we could talk about. Uh, pra pra what's called pragmatic t uh, test of truth, which is to say if it works, then just roll with it. Um, but for our purposes, um, no matter what people thought, they knew the world was not flat and therefore they believed a lie or at least they were misinformed about the truth. So they didn't know it. They believed it. And in hindsight, now that we know more than they knew, we can say they were wrong and therefore they were, their belief was in error. It was not knowledge. So I found this handy dandy little Venn diagram. Again, I teach a course in logic and we love our Venn diagrams. Um, they can do just wonderful things. So you see here um, a red circle that's belief, a blue circle that is truth, a yellow circle that is uh, justified, and where all three of those uh, correspond, you have knowledge at the center of the confluence of all three of those. Now, if you don't have all three, you have something else. Okay, look, you see the little arrow that's pointing to that little space that says denial. Okay, so in that case, um, something is true, it's justified, but you just don't believe it. So that's outside the red circle, and it's called just denial, right? You just refuse to believe it, um, but it's true and it is justified. Now, uh, look up there where um, there's a weird little kind of purple space where it says good guesses, right? So that's the confluence of true and believe uh, without justification, right? So something happens to be true and you believe it, but you don't have any good reason. You just happen to be lucky, okay? So... Uh, if you go, you know, if you were to go to the doctor and the doctor had a fishbowl full of random pills and you came in and you had, let's say, a serious sinus infection and you reached in and you grabbed out a mystery pill and you said, I believe this will heal me. And you took it and it just happens that what you pulled out of there was a very powerful antibiotic. Well, guess what? It was true. It actually did help you feel better. But you were not justified in that belief, right? You were just lucky. Um, there was no good reason to believe that what you would pull out of there was uh, efficacious. But it happened to be true, and you believed it, and you just got lucky. So uh, you might want to take a little time, look over this chart, um, and, and see those different points. Because as you're looking at uh, truth claims, and as you watch the films, and if you proceed through this course it might be helpful to be able to sort of say, oh, wait a minute, that's where this person is hanging out. Uh, they've got a false positive or they've got a lucky denial or uh, they are just out there in nonsense land. All right, so this next point uh, requires maybe a little uh, thinking, hard thinking here. So if you're driving, you might want to pull over. <laughs> and, and, and so when you say that a statement is true, 
Okay, so, and by the way, only statements can be true. Uh, arguments can be sound, but only statements can be true. But when you want to say that a statement is true, the truth of the statement has to be outside the statement itself. Okay, and technically we say the truth bearer uh, requires that we look outside the truth bearer itself. Okay, so with truth bearer means the words. All right. So if I say to you, uh, Dr. Shell has a PhD, that is a statement. If I want to know if it's a true statement, I have to go outside that individual statement to validate and verify the truth of that statement. The words are not true. It is its relationship to reality that makes it true. And this connected to that is this idea that words don't have meanings, they express meaning. So the meaning of words, the actual meaning, is not expressed in the words, but in the ideas outside the words. So an example of this is the famous uh, expression by uh, uh, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. It's one of the great statements in all of philosophy. Um, he believed that he was doubting every single thing under the sun. Everything is in doubt. But he couldn't doubt that he was thinking. And there came the in inspiration. The light bulb came on. That if I'm thinking, I must exist. So I can't doubt that. I think, therefore I am. And the Latin phrase that you should learn. You might win Jeopardy. Congito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Expressed in Latin. Or if you like French, he also wrote it in French, and I, I can't speak French, but I'll try. Je penais dos Jésus. Okay, so in French, the same idea. I think, therefore I must exist. But the words, whether you write it in English, Latin, or French, don't have the meaning. The meaning is in the relationship of the ideas expressed to reality that gives it its sense of meaning. Okay, so let's go and, and make this work for us. So, as I started before, Dr. Shell holds a PhD from the University of Kentucky. There's a statement. If you want to decide if it's true, you could meditate on those words, but you would never know if that's true. So the question becomes, how can you verify that that is a true statement? Okay, so you could ask me, you could send me an email, say, hey, Dr. Shell, do you actually hold a PhD from the University of Kentucky? And I would email you back and say, yes, I do. And you could be satisfied with that. You could say, okay, Dr. Shell told me so, I believe it. If you're a little more skeptical, you could be, hmm, I, I wonder if the University of Kentucky publishes a list of graduates. And we could run that down and we could do a search of database and see, does Dr. Shell hold a PhD from the University of Kentucky. You could then uh, decide uh, maybe the college has my resume on file. Um, so there's a variety of ways you could satisfy the truth condition to, to see if this statement corresponds to a fact in the world. Okay? Uh, or you could simply believe it and just roll and, and not ask and not say that it's true. You could just say, I believe it. Um, I'm also a pastor and um, I've used this to my advantage more than once. Uh, I've gone to visit a, a, a church member who's in the hospital, um, sometimes in the emergency room. And of course, they want to limit visitors, right? They're like, well, they're not, we're not having any visitors. And uh, frequently when I approach the, the hospital, of course, I have my a shirt and tie on. And uh, I at walk with authority, and occasionally somebody will say, oh, I'm sorry, sir, um, uh, th they can't have any visitors right now. And I will say, oh, n not even doctors? And they'll say, oh, no, of course, you can go in and see him if you're a doctor, right? And so they didn't ask if I hold a medical doctor, am I a medical doctor or hold a PhD and have the title doctor? So uh, they believed that I was a medical doctor. I simply didn't dissuade them from their, their incorrect assumption um, that I was a medical doctor. In fact, I am a PhD and I do have a PhD from the University of Kentucky and you can check it out if you want to. 
Okay, now this statement uh, is a little different character, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Shell is obsessed with Lego. Um, because you can't exactly verify. Um, we, in logic class, we talk about what they call um, weasel words. Obsessed is a little um, amorphous. So before you could sort of decide if this was true, you would have to decide what you mean by obsessed. Do you mean actually clinically di diagnosed as obsessive, or you mean that he's a real fan of Lego, which I am? Um, but once you decided that, you could say, well, okay, how could we determine if Dr. Shell was obsessed with Lego? Um, you maybe could find out how much time does he spend playing with Lego? Uh, the fact that he does whole entire lectures presenting himself as a, a, a Lego. Um, how much money does he spend uh, on Lego every year? Um, that, you know, tracking how many times he uses the word in, in a month. I don't know. You could come up with some sort of way to verify, validate that assessment that Dr. Shell is obsessed with Lego. It's not quite as clean as does he hold a PhD because it, it's hard to document uh, that statement. But you certainly could move that direction and say, I've gathered enough data that I can... Uh, say that I believe and I'm justified in the belief that that is true. Now, how about this statement? Dr. Shell believes he is a Lego. Now we've got a problem, don't we? Because, um, well, okay, let's do, do it first of all. First of all, the statement um, is true. That is, if Dr. Shell says he believes he is a Lego, um, then that statement is true, that Dr. Shell believes that. Okay, so the statement, Dr. Shell believes that he is a Lego, is true if, in fact, it corresponds that Dr. Shell actually holds that belief. Now, we then could go one step further and realize that that belief is false. That is, he is not a Lego, right? He, he breathes and talks and, and gives lectures and mows the grass. He does physical things that Lego can't do, okay? So the, the object of his belief is in error, but the fact that he believes it can still be true. And you got to watch this. Politicians and salespeople love to use this uh, this little, uh, it's a weasel word. It's a way to get around it. So I, you ask me, uh, will this car get 50 miles to gallon? Well, I believe it will. Okay, you buy the car. You're like, dang, I never get more than 25 miles in a gallon. If you go back and try to pin down that salesman, he will say, well, I didn't say it would, I said, I believe it would. No, I guess I was wrong. Okay. So they gave themselves plenty of room that uh, if you, and again, you will listen, politicians will use this. Like you will really try to nail them down and you'll say, well, or their, their spokesperson will say, well, uh, the president has a firm belief that this or that or, or, or the other thing is the case. Okay, notice that the person didn't say it was the case. He says that the president believes that it is the case. And that leaves a huge gap where you can drive a semi truck through that gives you enough room to get out when something doesn't work right. So this gets to the idea that you actually have to have a theory of truth. That is, what is it that you believe makes something true? And one theory of truth is called the coherence theory. And that is when I come upon a fact or a statement, I say that it is true if it fits what I already know to be the case. Okay. Or this statement here, the mark of falsehood is a failure to cohere in the body of our belief. So I have a set of beliefs. I come upon some new statements, some new uh, information, and I'll say, hmm, that must be true because it fits with what I already believe. Um, and this is why many people are threatened when they come up against ideas that they've never thought about before. And they reject them out of hand because they don't fit what they already know. And many times we're walking around with assumptions 
that we take to be true and knowledge, and we get really uh, depressed, not depressed, well, depressed and maybe even angry when somebody approaches those assumptions because suddenly everything we believe about and true as knowledge is going to fall apart if because these pieces are not going to fit together. So among my many uh, loves and passions is uh, Shakespeare. Uh, I just love Shakespeare. And uh, one of Shakespeare's plays called Othello is a just a, such a sad, tragic story, which is why it's a tragedy, um, about this uh, general named Othello and Desdemona, his true love, and they are madly in love at the beginning of the play. Um, they break social conventions and they run off and get married. And he's a powerful general and she is just a wonderful, loving wife. And they just have this wonderful, great relationship. Othello has a advisor named Iago, and he's the worst villain in all of Shakespeare, mainly because we don't really get any reason why he does what he does. He's just mean. He's just bad. So uh, Iago begins to poison Othello by telling him that his wife has been unfaithful to him. And he sets up a whole series of lies and innuendos and half-truths to entrap Othello's mind into believing that his wife has been unfaithful. And in the final horrible scene, he, he strangles her to death on their, their bed, um, yelling and screaming at her that she's been unfaithful. And all the time she's declaring that she's innocent and she didn't do anything. And he's saying that she had an affair with a guy named Cassio. And she says, well, let bring him in here and, and he'll tell you and we'll, we'll, we'll work this out. And Othello is like, oh, well, he'll never say anything again because they've killed him too. So in other words, whereas we might have been able to go and, and ba validate Othello's belief or not, he's destroyed the evidence. And the only person who could sort of explain everything is now dead. And so Desdemona is sort of doomed because of Othello's mistaken belief. Everything he's been shown by Iago coheres with his belief belief that his wife has been unfaithful to the point that he goes into a rage and murders her. And only at the end of the play do we discover that it was all set up by Iago. It was a complete um, setup. Uh, Othello has already killed himself. Um, everything has just gone uh, down. But it's all based on a belief that Othello had that, that was coherent because it all hung together, only it brought him to the wrong conclusion. Now, another way of talking about truth theories, theory of truth, is the correspondence theory. And that is, truth is what actually corresponds to facts in the world. That what I accept to be the truth and be true knowledge has to actually connect with the world that is and have a one-to-one -one correspondence. If Dr. Shell has a PhD, there should be a correspondence to the University of Kentucky granting a PhD to Dr. Shell and him claiming that he has one. To be a true statement, there has to be an actual connection to those facts. So they can be ideas, they can be uh, physical facts, t temporal facts, but they correspond to something that is actual in the world. Now, as we go through this course, you're going to realize that there are different ways of arriving at facts. There's empiricism, which says it has to be physical. It has to be something I can weigh, measure, test, are the only kinds of facts there are. Or there's rationalism that says some facts are, are mental, some facts are rational in the mind, but they're nonetheless, they're not, they're true because they are actual rational facts facts in, in, in time and space. So uh, mathematics might be an example of something to say, well, it's actually purely uh, in, in mind that mathematics works, but those are true because they correspond to actualities. Um, 
So within recent memory, we've actually had a really interesting illustration of um, correspondence and coherence theory uh, played out uh, in live television in front of our eyes. So if you think back to uh, President Trump's inauguration, um, President Trump and, and many of his um, supporters were were jumping on the fact that this was the largest inauguration ever and that there was a huge crowd, just unprecedented, unbelievable crowd. And um, the president himself said this and he said there was a million and a half people there. He got other people to say it. But then people began to sort of question that because they were looking at numbers that were coming from the National Park Service um, and that normally is the one that reports the crowd sizes at events. Um, and they were saying that it was far um, less than that. Um, and Sean Spencer, Spicer, who was the president's uh, press secretary, came out in the White House press room and said without uh, any hesitation, that this was the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration, period. So a statement like that is um, verifiable. So uh, it, it almost immediately all over the Internet and various news agencies all around the world simply ran the tape and they looked at photographs taking of President Trump's inauguration and uh, Bar uh, Barack Obama's um, uh, first inauguration, and the crowd sizes are clearly not larger. Um, and this was verified again. One of the things we do in, in logic class and in philosophy, really everybody should do it, which is called uh, lateral reading. That is, when you get a source and you want to verify that it's true, what you want to do is you want to look across a variety of sources and see if they all have about the same take on it, right? If, if the facts are in doubt, then you need to continue to do your research and withhold judgment, right? But if the evidence is uh, clear among variety of sources, then you, it becomes much stronger that you can take it for what it's worth. So the National Park Service says that the crowd size was 250,000. Uh, 250, thousand um, and the photographs from the time both of these are taken at almost exactly the same time right before the speech they write the inauguration itself and so uh, the clear evidence here is that the it does not correspond to the facts the facts are the correspondence to reality that you can check against a statement to decide if it's true. Now, it may not cohere with what you want to believe, right? Uh, there are things called inconvenient truths, that thing we don't really want to believe, but none the fact less they are the case. Um, many times we have to confront realities that we are not comfortable with, um, but that doesn't make them any less true. Um, and we have to accept it if we're gonna roll with a, a correspondence theory of truth. And that might have been the end of it. Uh, you know, it would have been sort of on a blip in uh, history, perhaps, except that um, the very next day, Kellyanne Conway, an advisor to the president, was on national television. I actually heard her say it live. I was watching it live when she said it. Um, and she was arguing with a, a, a news a reporter, and she's saying, what you're saying, it's a falsehood. And they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts. And then the conversation goes on and the commentator says, well, wait, there are no such thing as alternative facts. It either is a fact or it's not a fact. Um, and what it, 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 he generously said that an, a, a, uh, an alternate fact would be a, an untruth. It's a lie. Right. If you make up something that, you know, is not a fact, then you've got a lie. Now, you could have com uh, competing data. You could say, well, I've got some data that doesn't square with yours and maybe we need more information. But if something is a fact, then there isn't an alternative to it. Um, and you so that sort of this sort of statement became and that this prompted the 
uh, Times article f that we, we started this lecture with, that is truth dead. Have we just got to the place that we're living in Alice in Wonderland, that anybody can just say anything they want to say, and nobody can check it for its authenticity, its truth, and whether it should count as knowledge. So one of the textbooks that I sometimes use in my critical thinking class is called How to Think About Weird Things by Schick and Vaughn. And uh, they have a really nice uh, acronym, SEARCH, when you're looking for the truth, when you're looking for knowledge. He, they have this nice little uh, scheme, and you could use this literally to write it down as you work through uh, something that's important that you want to know, is this really the truth? So they say basically, state the claim clearly. Okay? So take what somebody's saying about global warming or about pandemics or about inoculations or whatever you want to say, and make sure you understand exactly what they are claiming. Remember that thing about Dr. Shell is obsessed. Okay, what does obsessed mean? Let's nail this down to say very precisely what is the claim. Secondly, you uh, evaluate the evidence. You gather the evidence for that particular claim. What is there that is being brought forward to say this is true? Then you want to say, well, what other explanations could there be? What alternate hypothesis could be brought forward? Consider all the alternatives. Again, what we tend to do is when we want to believe something, we don't look very hard for an alternative. And on the other hand, when we really don't want to accept something, we start looking high and low for any possible um, alternative explanation that we like better than the one we're looking at. But they point out that what you really need to do is develop a criteria for truth, right? We've talked about that, and they go into much more depth. But, but a correspondence criteria of truth, you want to rate each of those alternatives, each of those hypotheses, you want to rate them based on a consistent criteria. And then reason and logic says you should accept as true or at least truer the one that has the greatest claim based on the evidence, based on a criteria for truth. So uh, this is what we're talking about. When we get into philosophy and we're talking about truth, it's a struggle to find out what can we count on, how do we know if something is true, and then what should we act on based on our knowledge of those matters. Okay, well that was a, a, a lot of work to deal with the question of truth, and that will kick you off as you do the readings for this unit, uh, as you then begin to explore um, what it means that we seek to know the truth. Um, and I appreciate your time with this and I look forward to your uh, writing and your reflection on what it is to know the truth.